Hey, that's nice you're clapping. You haven't even heard me yet. Um, so welcome to the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation's inaugural Spotlight on Science. This is the first presentation of a series that we hope will continue next season. The goal of this series is to bring in top scientists, like Dean Bullock, to help us understand the big stories in science and technology. Fascinating topics such as artificial intelligence, CRISPR and DNA modification, global warming, the possibilities of nuclear fusion, the history of the universe, and innumerable other topics. One goal for tonight is that we, that we had planned was to try to determine the community interest in the series. And I can, <laughs> yeah, I can see this place is as packed as I think I've ever seen it. Um, but I've got to tell you that, that running this series going forward is, will require some research, some resources. So I'd like you all to consider a couple of things. First of all, whether you'd be interested enough to actually pay for a ticket to come and how much you might want to pay. Um, second, whether you might want to step up to become a sponsor for this series. And third, whether you might want to join a committee to help determine what future talks we'll have. So think about it, and you might want to talk to some of us, our CEO, Jerry Kappel, or the sponsors of this first Spotlight talk, um, Walkie and Janet Ray, and my husband, Bruce, and myself. Or you can also complete the survey that you'll all be getting tomorrow that will ask you questions about it. Um, so some housekeeping. Please silence or turn off your phones. Always forget that one. Um, I think we, I'm not even gonna ask you to see if there's any empty seats beside you because I don't really see any. Um, oh, okay, there's a few. So if we get some more people coming in, There'll be some spots. Um, so there'll be a question and answer after the talk. So hang on, hold your questions till then. And remember the library closes at nine. So you, however much you wanna stay here and talk to the dean, you gotta be out by nine. Um, so I wanna uh, thank the Rays, Walkie and Janet, and my husband, Bruce, for envisioning and sponsoring this first presentation and also thank the library and the Library Foundation for helping us to put this on. Um, we have a couple of foundation board members in the house tonight. Um, Janet Hadley and Dorothy Larson, I think are both here. Um, and we also have the chair of the library trustees, uh, Paul Watkins, there he is way in the back. Paul, couldn't you get a better seat? Um, okay, so next I want to go on and talk very briefly about Whitty Hall. You may have heard this before, but I think there's a lot of people who probably haven't. Um, the lectures that the foundation puts on have been held in this room for years. And we have been challenged, as you can see, by poor sight lines. It's hard for you guys in the back to see, right? Uh, old technology, stationary lighting, and not very comfortable seats. So now we have a vision of this new hall, which will soon become a reality. It's gonna have great sight lines, a tiered auditorium, a real stage, and state-of-the-art technology. The foundation, the Library Foundation, has agreed to pay to raise half the funds for this, and it is, will be called Witty Hall um, due to the lead gift from Bill Witty and his wife, Keiko Sakamoto. So here's a peek at what the hall will be like. What did I say about the technology?
<laughs> Just imagine Dean Bullock's talk and his photos in this kind of a facility as opposed to where we are tonight. So we invite you all to join us and we hope that you will help support this campaign to build, this, build the hall. Um, it obviously, it would be a great benefit, not only to the library, but to the entire community. So if you want any further information, please reach out to Jerry Kappel, and he'll be happy to discuss it. Um, the last thing I want to mention is our summer solstice program. Um, I know many of you are members of the foundation. How many are members of the foundation? Okay, that's pretty good. But those who aren't, if you join in the next month, you will be invited to summer solstice. Um, like last year, we're closing the season with this special event that will be free to foundation members who have joined within the last year. Uh, it's a reception, music, food, and a special presentation by Susan Strait, who is the award-winning author of the book Mecca. So if you're not a member, join in the next few weeks and you can come to this fun event that we'll be putting on. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Janet Ray. She's a member of the Library Board of Trustees, a great friend of the Library Foundation, and Janet will be introducing our speaker. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. This is so exciting to see all of your faces out in the, uh, in the audience, and we're excited about Spotlight on Science. And I have the great pleasure of introducing James Bullock, who uh, we actually, my husband, saw him uh, sp speak at UCI, but it was before the pandemic. We just spoke about it this evening, and uh, it's taken quite a while to, to put all this together because we weren't ready before. But uh, I will share with you a little bit about James and then hand it over to him. James Bullock is the Dean of Physical Sciences and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California, Irvine. As dean, he has helped to launch the UCI Edelman Quantum Institute, dedicated to the discovery of new quantum science phenomena. Now, I don't know too much about that, so I'm, gonna, I'm ready to learn. Enabling the next technological revolution and educating a diverse quantum workforce for the 21st century. Outside of his work as an academic leader, Bullock leads the research group in cosmology and galaxy formation to understand how galaxies and dark matter have evolved over billions of years, if you can imagine, in, in the co of cosmic time. <laughs> Dean Bullock is a member and former chair of the James Webb Space Telescope User Committee and currently serves on the Space Telescope Institute Council, which provides oversight to the Operations Center for the Hubble Space Telescope, which I'm sure you all have heard of, and the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Without further ado, let us welcome Dean James Bullock, right from our community, to the Newport Beach Public Library. Thank you for coming. Let me apologize. I didn't follow directions, so I brought my own laptop. Here we go. All right, we got the pointer. Hey, everybody! Thanks so much. It is. Uh, it really is a, a really great pleasure to be here. Uh, what a wonderful venue! You know, this library does so much for the community, and I'm just so excited that we're bringing science as well now to start this series. Um, you know, at UC Irvine, especially in the School of Physical Sciences, we firmly believe that science is a force for good uh, for the world. And uh, I hope you do too, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, and we, we got, and I'm really excited to tell some stories today about 
about the universe, things we're learning with this great new mission uh, called the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, you know, this is one of my favorite pictures of the night sky. Um, this is, of course, Easter Island. And stretched above Easter, Easter Island, we see this beautiful, beautiful dark night sky. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know, so the skies are dark. But the thing I like about it is you can imagine the folks who built those statues more than a thousand years ago. They would have looked up to see a sky that's not very much different than the sky that we see when it's very, very dark. And you'd imagine those people would probably have been asking themselves some of the same questions that we ask ourselves sometimes when we look up at the sky at night. Uh, what are those things? How many are there? How, how did we get here? How do we fit into this vast universe? Well, that's exactly the questions that scientists, professional astronomers and astrophysicists ask themselves too. And the thing that's kind of remarkable is that we've somehow managed to figure out quite a bit about what's going on up in a night sky like this. Um, and it's a testament, I think, to our abilities as humans to do it. Um, in a lot of ways, I think, when people think about the universe, it makes them feel small. But if you think about what we actually know, and I'm going to show you some pictures here and what we've done with something like the James Webb Space Telescope, I think it's things like that that should make us actually feel pretty big. And so that's what I want to talk about. So one of the things you see up here, right, is there's a dark band up in the sky. What that is there is that's the Milky Way. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Now, one of the ways that we've discovered all these things and we've managed to sort of unlock what's going on up there in the heavens uh, is using tools, telescopes. If you only have your naked eye, it's actually really, really hard to figure out what the heck's going on. Uh, but with telescopes and extending our sight into different wavelengths and just seeing deeper, fainter things, we've managed to really unlock this picture. Going back to you know, Galileo, who in 1609 was the first human to ever point a telescope up at the sky and see stars that no human being had ever seen before. To see the moons of Jupiter that no human being had ever seen before. And so this is what unlocks these understanding. And then I've shown some of the other sort of more famous telescopes that have pushed the boundaries. In 1908, the, the great Hooker Telescope in Mount Wilson, just right here in Southern California, really helped unlock that the universe was a universe of galaxies and not stars. The Keck telescopes in Hawaii are now the most powerful ground-based telescopes in the world that um, many astronomers at UC Irvine use regularly. We're fortunate to be a University of California campus. And we have access to these amazing ground-based telescopes. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched and at least successfully deployed roughly the same year that Keck was commissioned. Um, and it really unlocked many things. But today I want to talk about, I'll talk a little bit later about Webb, which was launched very recently. Now this is another picture from Easter Island, and now you really see that Milky Way up there in the sky, right? This band of light. Now what we're seeing is we're seeing the fact that we live in a vast disk of stars. Um, we live inside that disk, and so when we look edge on into it, we see lots and lots of stars, and when you look up out of it, you don't see as many. And the dust and gas in that also creates that kind of cast that shadow, so we really see it. Um, plainly there. If you could fly up out of the galaxy and you weren't trapped within it like we are, it would look something like this from above. The Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. That's a very, very long distance. Uh, a light second is 186,000 miles. That's one second. So this is how far light can travel in 100,000 years. If you took the Milky Way galaxy and you shrunk it down to the size of the Pacific Ocean, now imagine a leaf floating on the Pacific Ocean. That leaf is the solar system. All the way out, I'll give you Pluto. <laughs> Someone was talking about Tom Brown. Don't tell Tom that I said that. Um, all the way out to Pluto, that's a leaf. Now imagine a bee sitting on the leaf and a piece of pollen on the leg of that bee. That's the sun. The nearest star to the Earth, I mean to the sun, is another piece of pollen about three miles away. And there's hundreds of billions of those stars in our galaxy, this vast ocean, right? So this is what, this is what we're doing. 
Um, there are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. We think there are about 40 billion habitable planets, habitable planets that potentially maybe could have liquid water. That's what that means, but that's a lot of planets. About 10 million black holes and about a lot of other cool stuff in this galaxy of ours. Um, another thing I want, oh, and by the way, that bright little uh, yellow thing, that's where the sun is in a spiral arm. Let's go back to this picture. You see those circles there, the things I've circled, they look like pieces of the Milky Way kind of broke off, they're little clouds in the sky. Those are actually distant galaxies. Those are galaxies called the Large Magellanic Cloud and Small Magellanic Cloud, named after Magellan, who was the first European to see them with the naked eye in the southern hemisphere, go to the southern hemisphere and be able to see them. You can't see them from the north. You can see these by eye if it's very, very, very dark and you're in the southern hemisphere. You can actually see them by eye, but those are, those are not the Milky Way. Those are distant galaxies. And this betrays the fact that the, the Milky Way is actually part of a group of galaxies that we call the local group. There's lots of little satellites orbiting around the Milky Way. So up here on the left, you can see I do have a pointer. There's the Milky Way. That's our little disk. And there are a few satellite galaxies orbiting around it that are much smaller than us. The large Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud were the things I just showed you. That other big galaxy that's not, you know, not that far away from us, just a couple million light years away, um, is the Andromeda Galaxy. It's kind of our sister, uh, roughly the same size as the Milky Way. If the disk of the Milky Way were the size of a quarter, Andromeda would be another quarter about this far away. So it's actually pretty close. Much, much closer than, say, stars are to each other, relatively. So that's kind of, that's sort of our, now that's 10 million light years here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out. Because we're going to get, I'm going to give you a map of the, of the universe. We're going to zoom out by a factor of 10. That, now we're 100 million light years across. Each dot on that picture is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. The thing that's interesting is it's not a random orientation of galaxies. They're actually structured. They, they tend to stretch out along filaments and structure. And understanding why we have that structure is one of the things that we, we're trying to figure out today. What, what's the origin of this and why? Um, let me zoom out even more. That's a billion light years. I jumped by a factor of more than... So now uh, we stop naming things after this because there's just too many of them. <laughs> You might notice some names on here. What, what we're doing is we name stuff by the names of the constellations we have to look through to see those things to orient where they are in the sky. That's how, kind of how the names work. But anyway, that's a billion light years, and they, they, it keeps going after that. And I'll show you some more pictures of stuff. Now, the thing that's kind of amazing about this um, is um, most of these galaxies are actually moving away from each other. We can measure how fast they're moving relative to us by looking at their light. And if the light, it turns out that if light is moving away from us, its color shifts. It's called redshift. It's a lot like the Doppler shift. If a car goes by and goes like that, the sound waves is going down as it's moving away. The frequency is going down as it's moving away. Same way with the light. As the light's moving away from us, it gets kind of stretched. And you can measure that stretch, and you can measure the speed by measuring the stretch of the wavelength of the light. Um, and we, what we found over the last 100 years or so is these galaxies, most of them that are far away from us are moving away, and the way we interpret that is that the universe is expanding. So this discovery was one of the first things that led eventually to the development of what's called the Big Bang Theory, that the universe is expanding, and in the past it was smaller, and in the past it was smaller and smaller and smaller, and if you go all the way back, it was almost potentially infinitely small. Um, it's not just from that. There's a lot of other data that we could talk about later about why we believe that this is the case, but we've developed this story now, this, this scientific picture of how the universe began, and we think that about 13.8 billion years ago, all of matter and energy in our observable universe were all crunched down into a very, very small volume, um, and then after that, the universe was expanding. We think the universe was born incredibly hot, but also very, very simple. So there was no structure. In fact, there were not even atoms. It was too hot for there to be atoms. Um, we think it was born in the very earliest times. There were nothing but the most fundamental of elementary particles. And then from this incredibly simple primordial soup eventually emerged everything we see around us today. Um, and so things were actually born quite simple. And from this simple origin, 
we emerge complexity. Um, interestingly, the very first, you know, in the very beginning of the universe, after about a minute or so, there were really only two elements that existed, hydrogen and helium. Um, and over time, uh, gravity allowed stars to form in a stars or galaxies. Those galaxies are sort of ecosystems, and it turns out when stars are shining, they're fusing elements together. They're taking hydrogen and fusing it into heavier elements, and eventually through these acts of star formation, and eventually when stars die, they produce much, much heavier elements, um, elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And on at least one planet, after about 13.8 billion years, uh, suddenly these creatures emerge that could look back up at the sky and try to decipher what the universe is all about and are able to tell you this story. So it's the universe looking at itself. We're, we are the universe trying to understand itself. And like I say, it's actually remarkable, <laughs> I think, that you know, floating on this leaf in this cosmic ocean, you know, we've managed to figure this stuff out. We want to learn more. There are still mysteries we're trying to solve. And one of the reasons, you know, one of the ways we're trying to do that is to build incredible, incredible machines like this James Webb Space Telescope I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about the engineering. I think there are a couple folks here who probably could tell you even more about it than me. Um, but um, it's, it's a marvel. It's an engineering marvel. It is one of the most incredible instruments I think humanity has ever produced. It's like the pyramids. It's like it's the triumph of what great civilizations can do. Um, it is a mirror that is six and a half meters across. Six and a half meters in diameter is the size of the mirror on this telescope that had to fold up and go on a rocket and get launched into space. It observed, and I'll show you a little bit more about the kind of light it observes, but it observes light in the infrared, and the infrared is basically heat. And so heat, other kinds of heat, background heat is noise to this telescope. It's like a bright glare that you don't want. And this, this big thing is called the sun shield, this big flat thing. And that is pointed at the sun at all times to keep the heat down on the other side of the telescope where the instruments are. It's more than a 500 degree Fahrenheit difference between the temperature on the sun side of the sun shield and the other side of the sun shield. And that's just the sun shield creating that temperature gradient. There's no other, there's other kinds of cooling on it but that does a huge chunk of it. And so just that sun shield alone is amazing. And it also folded up in a rocket and unfolded and got out the space. Um, the power of Webb compared to Hubble, Hubble is the, was the first sort of major space telescope that was launched. It's, it's a different kind of telescope. As I mentioned, the JWST telescope observes light in the infrared and longer wavelengths. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that tells us. Um, but one thing it does, it allows us to see higher redshift objects, objects that are moving really, really fast away from us, which means they're really, really far away. Um, it's a bigger, bigger mirror. So in terms of depth and the kinds of things that it allows us to see, you know, you could argue it's about 100 times more powerful than the famous Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so it's just an unprecedented, unprecedented thing. It was launched on Christmas uh, 2021. Uh, that was a very, <laughs> people were very nervous. People spent their entire careers, thousands and thousands of people from every state in the country, hundreds and hundreds of companies, uh, educational institutions worked for years on this thing. And everything was put in the nose cone of a rocket <laughs> and fired, right? And so the people were nervous. Uh, but this thing was about the most, per it went about as well as anything I've ever seen in sort of space science. It was just perfect. There were hundreds of single point failures that did not fail. So there were hundreds of teams of individuals who did their job so perfectly that it didn't fail. And it has given us this miraculous instrument that we're starting to learn stuff from every day. Um, today, it's a million miles from Earth. That's four times the distance to the moon. So it's nowhere close to the Earth. Hubble orbits very close to the Earth. You could even send, in principle, astronauts there, if you remember that. Can't do that with Webb. Uh, it's at a, at a special orbit called L2, and it has this kind of funky orbit, but it turns out it's stable. And um, it's, you, know, you can't see it here, but, but
but it's, it's beyond the orbit of the moon. So it's very, very far away. And you know, one of the reasons why it's out there is we're not interfering with the Earth as much. Um, it's a very kind of quiet place to be to study things that are going on. So what I'm going to do, one thing I wanted to do is just tell you some things about what we're finding with, with Webb. And we're finding all kinds of things. And the way I thought I would organize this is with distance from the sun. So we're going to start near the sun. And when I say near, I mean 40 light years, <laughs> very nearby. And then we're going to go out. And so in this first part of the talk, everything I'm going to show you is within that circle around the, around the sun. So here's a, Here's an artist's interpretation of a planet that James Webb studied, which is pretty close to the sun. It's only, like I said, 40 light years away. It's a rocky planet that's about the same size of the Earth. But it orbits a star uh, that is a different kind of star than ours, and it's very, very close to its home world. Its orbit is only two days, so it takes us a year to go around the sun. This thing goes around its star in two days. So it's, you know, it's a vast, uh, vastly different kind of world. But the thing, one of the things that, that Webb did is it, it tried, it, it discovered that it's there. It validated its existence. And a technique that we use to study planets like this and know that they're there uh, is to actually look at just the star. So to put this in context, you know, the Earth is a billion times fainter than the sun. So if you were trying to see the Earth from afar, it would be like a firefly next to a nuclear explosion. It's, it's hard to do that. It's hard to image those things, and so it's an easier, it turns out it's an easier way to see it is to look at the star and see if its light gets dim over time and then gets bright again, and that's when the, that's when the planet goes in front of the star. So what you're seeing here is time on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, and the vertical thing is how bright this star is, and then you see for a long time it stays a certain brightness, and then all of a sudden it gets a dip, it dips lower, and then it comes back. And it turns out that if you watch this day after day after day, it does this over and over and over again. So it really is this kind of steady signal. Now, one of the things that I'll point that I'll see, you probably can't read the axis, but the top number is 100%. And the dip at the bottom there is 99.9%. <laughs> so it got a lot darker, 0.1%. And that's the kind of precision you need to do this kind of stuff, right? But, but it's with that level of precision that we know how big the planet is and stuff like that. So hold on to that. Remember this. I'm going to come back to something like this very soon. So that was 40 light years. Now I'm going to 460 light years. Boom, I'm jumping a lot. This is a uh, beautiful picture, right? This is a picture of a newly forming star. So there's a star that's going to be like the sun, but it hasn't formed just yet. And so it's beginning to grow and accrete material. And when it does this, it's a, you know, when stars grow, it's a very messy process. And so there's a disk of material being accreted onto the star. And then there's a lot of, there's jets of activity blowing out from the surface of that disk. And that's what's creating all these sort of winds and the flare and all, and all that kind of cool looking stuff. Um, you couldn't see any of this if you were looking in the optical. So this is infrared light. So you're seeing only the, the infrared. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's our ability to kind of study the way stuff is flowing out of the star to understand the efficiency of star formation. It turns out, like one of the big questions in astronomy is, how easy is it to take just ambient stuff left over from the Big Bang and turn it into stars? And it turns out it's incredibly inefficient. So most of the stuff doesn't turn into stars. It, it just gets blown out. And so this is one way that we study that kind of stuff. And also, it's incredibly beautiful. And it's just the fragmentation of the gas and stuff. Anyway, that's 460 light years. Now I'm going to go 700 light years, and I'm showing you another planet. This is a bigger planet. This is about the third the size of Jupiter, and it's orbiting a, a star. OK, so what do we have here? We have another one of these things where, over time, the thing is steady brightness, and then it gets dimmer and then it gets bright again. So what we're seeing is a, a, a planet go in front of that star. But there's more information here. You see there's different colored dots on the bottom panel. There's red ones, there's purple ones, and there's green ones. That's different wavelength light. So the red stuff is a little redder light, a little bit longer wavelength, and the green stuff is a little bit shorter wavelength. And what you see is that the red stuff is not getting dimmed as much. As the, as the green stuff. 
So the, some of the light's making it through this planet a little bit easier than other. What we're looking at is the atmosphere of the planet. And the atmosphere lets the uh, red light in, red light through more easily than the, than the green light. So why do we care about this? So it turns out that different kinds of molecules and atoms absorb light differently depending on the wavelength of that light. And if you really understand the atmospheric chemistry, you can use that to figure out what the atmosphere is made of. And that's what these astronomers have done. What's shown here to some extent is the different kind, signatures of different kinds of, of molecules in the atmosphere of this planet. So what's shown along the horizontal axis is the wavelength of the light, whether it's short or long, whether it's red or blue. And then it's just the amount of the light that's being absorbed along the top. And so what we see here, it turns out, we see strong evidence for carbon dioxide, a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this planet. Um, there's also, it turns out, there's water. We see pretty, pretty big signatures of water vapor in this planet atmosphere. This planet, by the way, 700 light years away, we're telling you there's water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this planet. <laughs> and eventually we hope to be able to see signatures that there's life on planets using techniques like this because there's certain molecules that wouldn't be stable if there weren't life, right? If we saw a booming oxygen sig signature in an Earth-like planet by doing these kind of methods, people would get very excited, right? Um, it turns out also there's sulfur dioxide there and that sulfur dioxide being there is interesting because it suggests photochemistry and the people who study this kind of stuff get very excited about things like that. So there's, there's interesting, very interesting kind of just sciencey stuff. There's deeper understanding of what the atmospheres of planets and it's these kind of techniques we aspire to eventually use to tell you whether or not there's life. 700 light years, 2,500 light years. So this is called the Southern Ring Nebula. What we're seeing here, this thing, this is called a planetary nebula. I never like that word because it doesn't really have anything to do with planets. So I try not to use it, actually. What's going on is there's a star, a big massive star is dying. So I showed you before a star being born. And now I'm showing you a star at the end of its life. And it's a very massive star that's throwing out material as it's kind of in its last throes of fusion. And um, on the left, um, we have shorter wavelength infrared light and on the, on the right it's it's longer wavelength infrared light you can see very different images depending on what the wavelength of the light you're looking at so some of the light comes to us more easily some of it's reflected some of it's absorbed and it's by looking at these kind of different pictures you get a much deeper sense of what's going on on the right basically you see that star in the middle and the, uh, it's and, it, and all the stuff it's thrown out from its outer atmosphere and the one on the left, you can't quite peer in and see the star quite as well. And you're seeing different kinds of molecules, different kinds of material that's being thrown out. This kind of stuff is interesting because it's actually in the shedding of the atmospheres of old stars. There's a lot of heavy elements in there, the kind of elements that will eventually, you know, we, you know, it's, it's a very good chance that, you know, the, the oxygen that you're breathing was sort of expelled in some event like this. Stuff like that. So it's interesting to study that. Kind of, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 6,500 light years. I'm still in the bubble, by the way. We're still in that little circle. Um, this is real. <laughs> yeah, these are not artwork. This is, this, is, this, is, this is for real. The one on the left was a, a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a very famous Hubble Space Telescope called the Pillars of Creation. It's these giant gas clouds that are beginning to break off and form new stars. On the right, exactly the same, exactly the same in, uh, picture, but now with web and infrared light. I mean, we're, you can see lots of things here. You can see that this dust, you can actually see through the dust in the infrared light. You can look through it. Um, you can see the stars behind it much more clearly, right? There's all this dust and gas that's absorbing the starlight from behind this thing on the left. On the right, those stars just shine right through because we're looking at the infrared light. So it allows us to sort of see pieces of the universe we couldn't see, understand these, these vast star-forming regions in ways that we could never see them before. Um, okay. 
I'm tempted to spend forever on each figure, but uh, each picture, we got a lot of cool pictures. Okay, now, take a guess. Is this a real picture, or is this a cartoon? No, it's a cartoon. So, so this, is one of, this is me. This is me trying to draw a picture, because I didn't have a good one. So now what I'm doing, I'm zooming out. I'm zooming out now, the, all of the Milky Way is in that little bit, and then, and then that, what I've circled now is one of those little satellite galaxies I talked about. It turns out that those satellite galaxies, because they're younger, they're forming stars more rigorously than the Milky Way is. The Milky Way is kind of an old, not an old, middle-aged thing. The little galaxy, those little ones are younger and they're more vibrant, like they're teenagers, and so they're like going crazy and making stars and doing dumb things. So that's what's going on in the <laughs> SMC. But what we can do, it turns out, that when we peer deeper into the universe, in the very, very early universe, all the galaxies are doing teenager things. And, but we've got a couple locally, and we want to understand them in detail in our own backyard so we can interpret that stuff when it's, when it's very far away. So here's an example of a beautiful nebulae that's 160,000 light years away in the, in the um, SMC. And um, you see that the, the, there's a bright star it's centered on right there. And um, the, those red and orange clouds that look kind of like fire flames that are sort of shooting out of it, um, those are clouds that are being irradiated by the light of this young star. So it's kind of eating out this cocoon of, of gas where it was born within, and now it's kind of irradiating it away. And it's sort of opening it up for us to see. Uh, so that's 160,000 light years away. 210,000 light years away. This is another kind of young star forming region. It's one of the more beautiful pictures. And you're seeing these streams of gas kind of edge on. And there's a lot of uh, hydrogen that you're seeing glowing red there. That's kind of excited and glowing red from the radiation from the young stars. Um, and, you know, mainly I wanted to show this one just because it's one of my favorites. It's just so gorgeous. 210. Uh, thousand light years away. Now I'm going to zoom out more. Okay, so now that's sort of a billion light years. We're going to look at some individual galaxies. So we've, what we've been looking at before is stuff that's little pieces inside of galaxies. Stars and then regions of stuff that were just making up a big galaxy. Now I'm going to show you some like full galaxies. 32 million light years away. This, this one's called NGC 628. Um, we're looking at the molecular gas that makes up this galaxy. I'm going to talk about it in a second, but what I want to show you real fast is what this same galaxy looks like with Hubble. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what we think of when we think of a galaxy, right? This is the starlight. We're seeing the starlight, a little bit of dust lanes, the spiral arms. Now we see the gas that's underlying those stars. And the gas is much thinner. It's colder. It turns out it can fragment and make these really cool images. There's this thing in the middle that's carved out. The really, those red dots, those are old stars that are shining. You see them individually. And the blue, the blue dots are young stars that are shining. It turns out young stars tend to be very massive and glow blue. Older stars tend to be lower mass, and they glow red, it turns out. Um, so yeah, this is pretty awesome. 32 million light years. Ours is yellowish green. Someone said, what color is our galaxy? Our galaxy, our whole galaxy, what color? Oh, and the sun is kind of green yellow. We know what the sun is, green yellow. So it's not too red, it's not too blue, it's sort of normal. Okay, so this is a cool, very famous, actually, group of galaxies. Remember how I said uh, Andro or the Milky Way and Andromeda, that our two spirals were close, they're like quarters? Turns out they run in, galaxies run into each other quite a bit. And here we see a group of galaxies that's kind of running into each other. Um, it's called Stefan's Quintet because there's another galaxy that's out of frame, okay? And you can see streams of light that are coming out, and these, star these galaxies are kind of tearing, tearing stars out from each other. Um, but you all know this. I'm guessing every one of you has seen these galaxies before. You're like, oh, yeah. Let me show you. <laughs> so if you uh, have seen It's a Wonderful Life, remember how the angel, I don't know, everyone, most people have seen it. You know, the angels are talking to each other, and they're talking about Clarence, and they're worried about George Bailey. That's the same galaxies that are on the left. Now. 
1946, this was kind of the best they had. <laughs> so that's what that looked like. It's kind of an old photographic image. And on the left, that's what, this, that's what Webb's doing compared to where we've been. Uh, but you know, it's actually the same, they're the same ones. It's oriented, it's, like, it's actually, or, it's, I, I didn't turn it the right way, but like you have to turn it about 90 degrees. Um, but but it's, but it's the same galaxies, so. Anyway, so now you learn something about it. it's a wonderful life. 290 million light years. 500 million light years. This thing's called the Cartwheel Galaxy. And um, what's happened here is you see how it comes like, like a ring and then there's something bright in the middle. Another galaxy has punched right through it. And when it punched right through it, it creates that kind of ring. And uh, you know, one of, the th one of the things I do in my research is I run simulations of this kind of stuff to see how do I make that happen? You know, you run something through it and, and see if you can make that happen. It's kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, so it's just these beautiful images, 500 million light years away, and we keep to see these things. And understanding, you know, how these kind of collisions drive new star formation is one of the things we're trying to do. There's no picture I can really show you of now of how far away we're going to look, but the point is it's way outside this. Beyond a billion light years is where we're going to go now. And we're, we're sort of nearing the, we're moving on. Okay, so this is a, this thing is 4.6 billion light years away. Oh no, sorry. I got the distance wrong. Oh, I screwed it up. Okay, this is actually, but it's a good, it's a teaching moment. So, <laughs> okay, the light from this cluster, the light that we're seeing from the galaxies in this cluster left it 4.6 billion years ago. Now, that doesn't mean it's 4.6 billion light years away. Does anyone know why? I really hate to do this, but. Because the universe is expanding, right? Because the universe is expanding. Journalists get this all wrong all the time, by the way. Every time there's a web picture, the journalist always says 4.6 billion light years away. It's not. It took the light 4.6 billion light years to get here. So the light left it 4.6 billion years ago, but then it kept expanding away from us since then. So it's probably something like 10 billion, I didn't do the calculation, it's probably something like 10 billion light years away now. Um, but there's a vast galaxy cluster here. So galaxies tend to sometimes live in groups, and this is a huge cluster of galaxies that's probably about a thousand times more massive than our galaxy. Yeah, so we're thousands of galaxies orbiting around in it. So now I'm going to zoom in on it to kind of talk a little bit about what we're looking at. So this thing here, do not let this distract you. This is just a star in the Milky Way that's in between us and this thing we're trying to take a picture of. And so that's why it's so bright and weird looking. So if you could somehow ignore this. Um, but all the other stuff is super interesting. So all the white stuff here, those are galaxies that are in that cluster. So those are things that are all living, you know, uh, 10 billion light years away in this one ball and they're orbiting each other. But there's all, it turns out there's all this extra mass there besides the mass we can see in the light. And it's one of our pieces of evidence why we think there's all this additional mass in the universe that we call dark matter. We think there's a vast amount of dark matter that's kind of around all of these galaxies. Now one of the ways we know that this extra mass is there because of a phenomenon called gravitational lensing. Now one of the things you might notice is there's these other kind of yellowish looking galaxies here that are these kind of arcs. You see this one and this one and there's one over here. They're kind of these stretched out looking things. Galaxies don't look like that. So what that is is it's a normal looking galaxy that's kind of like the Milky Way that's much farther behind the cluster. And the light from that galaxy has come and it's passed through the vast gravity of the cluster and that gravity has bent the light and it's bent it in such a way that it's stretched it out on the sky and creates these arcs. If you've ever, like something you could do is if you've ever taken a wine glass and like held it next to a candle or a bright light and kind of look through it, you'll see that that candle light will look bent and stretched and, and that's a lensing effect from the glass. So that very same kind of lensing effect we see from gravity and big structures like this. But there's stuff that you see here and when this picture came out, Astronomers were 
a gap that they've never seen anything like this before because there's we've seen stuff kind of like this before these arcs but if you look up here at this thing you see this thing kind of looks like a pancake that's kind of been folded in on itself that's a gravitational lensing effect and it's actually lensed by this galaxy here by itself but it's such a weird distortion that only with the precision of Webb could you begin to see this and that distortion of this galaxy allows us to figure out what the mass of this lensing galaxy is. And every little arc we see here is allowing us to do stuff like that. The other thing that the, these lensing arcs do, it turns out, this lens, it actually magnifies the system behind it like a pair of binoculars. So that it acts like putting binoculars on web to allow you to see stuff even fainter than you can see without it. So some of the most distant um, and highly studied distant galaxies in the universe are actually galaxies that have been gravitationally lensed and boosted basically by the gravity of this gigantic cluster to allow us to sort of peak and see things even farther away than we could have with Webb. Um, so this is, there's, there's so much cool physics and astrophysics in this picture. Um, you could talk about it for a very long time and just pick, pick, pick out each little thing. And just let me remind you, that right there is a galaxy, the spiral arms, 200 billion stars, right? So is that one. This one's probably 600 billion stars. You know, there's just so much going on here. Okay. Oh, I see, I got it right down here. So billions of light years. I didn't try, just billions. <laughs> okay. Now we're getting really far. So I, this is right. This is about, these things are about 20 billion light years away. <laughs> 20 billion light years away. Um, the light travel time here, the light left at 12 billion years ago. So trying to put this in perspective, the sun's 4.6 billion years old. So this is the, these, the light left these galaxies. We're seeing pictures of galaxies that existed billions of years before the Milky Way, the, before the sun. But another thing that's kind of interesting is that these galaxies existed before the carbon in your bodies existed. Most of the carbon that's incorporated into the Earth was made in much subsequent generations of stars much after this point. So the atoms that make up your body, that make life possible, most of them did not exist when these, <laughs> these galaxies existed. It's incredibly far back. So what's shown here is a, is a, an, um, a comparison between what each galaxy, these are actually the same four galaxies, but here this is what we could see with the Hubble Space Telescope, this incredible thing that we had, uh, the most powerful space telescope ever built before Webb, and then on the bottom is what we see in the same galaxies if we look at them with Webb. And one of the things that we've noticed that's been actually one of the really interesting puzzles that a lot of us have been trying to figure out is, if you look at the top, these galaxies all look pretty ratty looking. They look kind of round and a little bit fuzzy. And that's not what galaxies look like today. The Milky Way is this kind of beautiful spiral. And we had kind of grown to think, at least, and a little bit because it was kind of in line with our conventional wisdom. We thought early galaxies, some of the very first ones to form, would have been kind of messed up looking and not as ordered as the Milky Way because we think it takes a little time to build galaxies as sort of structured and ordered as the Milky Way. And it was like, oh no, at early times they didn't look that structured and ordered, so that's kind of what we thought. But it turns out we were just missing details. That if you look now with Webb, you can actually see that this, is, uh, this actually looks like a disk. And this one does too, and this one does too. This one's still pretty round. But this was very unexpected. And there's sort of a puzzle right now of how the heck you make these grand looking disk galaxies so quickly after the Big Bang. So that's been a puzzle that a lot of us have been scratching our heads about. Um, do those galaxies still exist? It's a great question. They, the, a lot of the stars in those galaxies probably do exist, but it's probably very likely that those galaxies have merged with other galaxies subsequently and have become like a big giant cluster or something, a big ball of stars that doesn't really look like that anymore. Um, because like I said, remember how I was saying that like galaxies tend to run into each other? If you give galaxies enough time, they'll find some other galaxy and merge and they get kind of messed up. So to some extent, they probably do exist, but they probably exist in a really different form today than they, than they did then. That's a good, great question. 
Um, okay. So now I'm sort of at the edge. So this is kind of as far back as we've really been able to confirm and see. We, there's one other galaxy that very recently was confirmed to be about as distant as the most distant one here. So what are we doing here? Um, so it turns out that what, we ha what, what we're doing here is we have this vast big field of galaxies. Now, I should just start here and just stare at this for a second. So this whole size of this picture is a point on the sky that's like, you can't really see my laser pointer, but imagine, you see the laser pointer over there? Imagine a dot on the sky that's about 10 times smaller than that laser pointer. That's the size of this. And it's a very, very dark part of the sky that with the telescope on the ground looks just completely dark. And then if you look at this with Hubble for about 30 minutes, you just, you get this, you get this picture. So there's all kinds of stuff here. Most of the galaxies that we see that have popped up are, you know, nearby, you know, only billions of light years away from us, but not, you know, t 2 billion light years away. And they're sort of, that's why they're bright and kind of big on the sky. They're sort of closer. But these boxes here, here is called one, and this one over here is called two. The little blobs in the middle uh, are some of the most distant galaxies we've ever been able to take images of. And this one in particular actually is verified with a spectrum. So it's actually, we were actually able to break the light from it in its, in down to its constituent colors and from that really measure the redshift and therefore distance really, really accurately. Could have never done this without web. That would have been impossible. And shown that this thing, uh, what's plotted here with these Zs, that's the redshift of the light. So what that means is that's how many times faster than the speed of light this thing is moving away from us. So redshift 10 galaxy is moving away from us and recession velocities at 10 times the speed of light. Now some of you might say to yourself, that can't be right because Einstein said nothing can go faster than light. But there's a trick. It's not moving through space faster than light and that's what Einstein said you couldn't do. You can't move through space faster than the speed of light. Space is moving. So it's space itself that's expanding faster than the speed of light. And that's why we're getting this effective redshift. So these are some of the highest redshift, the fastest moving objects that we've ever seen away from us. And also because that's connected to the age of the universe at those times, we can map them to their current ages. So the light travel time of this galaxy here was about 13.5 billion years. So we're seeing that thing as it was 13.5 billion years ago, just about 300 million years after the Big Bang. Um, those galaxies are probably about 30 billion light years away from us now. Well, if they still exist, but you know, they, those, that, that away point is about 30 billion light years away from us now. Um, it, yeah. Uh, it's, I think this frame is f about 400 million pixels, yeah. Ah, okay, great. So, um, let me, so yeah, I'll answer that. So the question is this. Okay, we're, th there, we have this telescope that's a, billion, that's a million miles away. It's collected these data, which is basically a photograph, an image, a digital image, that it's, that it's relayed down to Earth through a series of satellites. How long does it take then to analyze those data and figure out what the heck this is to create the picture? Um, well, it turns out that, that the, the institute that runs, based, uh, one, runs JWST has a lot of software pipelines that it has built. And so, to actually, and so it took a while to build those software pipelines, but once we get the data down here and to create the image, um, to create a raw image that's not as beautiful as this, you know, you could probably make it in about an hour. Um, but it turns out that these very, very beautiful images that kind of pop like this, um, those are made by teams of people at the Space Telescope Science Institute that play with color stretches and map wavelengths in the IR and the infrared to wavelengths that your light can see in ways that really bring out the features. And so it's almost like an art. 
So they're real pictures. It's not like it's not nothing's being faked, but you're sort of adding, you're, you're mapping the colors in ways that really allow our eyes to see the stuff uh, that we couldn't see before. And that can take days because they're, they're just making it more and more beautiful. And so the science is usually done actually not by the ones who make these beautiful pictures. The ones the scientists kind of make, but themselves look more like this, the ones that aren't quite as awesome looking. And they're spending their time creating those spectra and, and really measuring the precise properties like wavelength and stuff like that, while the team at Space Telescope uh, and NASA make the kind of press quality images that are just so gorgeous. Hopefully that's, that's helpful. Um, so this is kind of representative of as far back as we've seen. These are some of the most distant things that we've ever sort of verified to actually be there at these incredible distances and speeds. And one of the goals, one of the things we're trying to do with the James Webb Space Telescope, and the reason why, one of the reasons why it's oriented in the infrared so we can measure these very high redshift galaxies, is to start to figure out, well, how soon after the Big Bang did these galaxies begin to form? What were the first galaxies? What did they look like? And then how different were they than the ones that we see this around us today? Um, and this is kind of the frontier. So we'll keep looking. Um, there'll be more to tell when, when we have the new beautiful conference pavilion. Uh, I can come back and show you even more distant galaxies then. So I think I'm gonna take some questions and I'll leave you with this cool picture. Yeah. yeah. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Dean Bullock will uh, call on you and then the people in the audience will bring you a mic so everyone can hear the question. I'm calling? Yeah. Okay, all right. Where is space, where is space expanding to? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a hard one. So, this is, you're not going to like this answer. <laughs> but it's not expanding into anything, because it is everything. I know they don't like that, but, you know, so the Big Bang, right, you know, you sort of have this picture in your head that, like, everything was squeezed in the one spot, and then now it's expanding, you know, out of that spot. But you can't stand back and look at that spot, because in order to stand back and look, you have to be in space. So all of us, everywhere, everything, all at once, we're all, we're all scrunched <laughs> in, into this much denser pocket. And so um, it is creating the space that is expanding into. That's the, that's the only thing I can say. So it's, you can't, you know, it, it is space itself that is expanding. And there's another kind of popular question that is also I'm going to give you another unpopular answer, which is what happened before the Big Bang. Now, it's possible there actually was kind of interesting physics that, that, that was happening at the very, very near the very beginning, such that there was not a Big Bang. So that's, that's, that's a possibility. But according to the, the, the sort of strict Big Bang theory, there was nothing before the Big Bang because time also began at the Big Bang. So before doesn't make any sense. And so it's a, it's a similar kind of answer that outside of space, uh, it's, you can't define that question because um, you need to have space to be outside of, right? So you just can't even be outside of it because space and time were all created at this point. And, you know, we are the space that we're expanding into at some level. I know you're unhappy. I can see you frowning. But, <laughs> but okay. Other I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on because it's not, I'm never going to make you happy. So you want to go here? Yeah, they're gold, the, the mirrors are spraying, yeah, yeah. Not, this is a model, but yeah, the real one, yep. Really, really gold, yep. Uh -huh. How do you measure your timeline? Like 200 million years, 2 billion years? How do we know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, what's the measurement on it? Because we haven't traveled that far. Yes, that's a great question. Yeah, how, how do we measure these distances because we haven't traveled that far? Um, well, when things are nearby and we don't have to think about the universe expanding, it's pretty straight, well, we, we, there are a series of steps that we use to figure out how far away objects are in the universe. And you know, if this were an astronomy class, we would spend a week talking about 
the techniques that astronomers use to measure distances. Because you're right, all you see in the sky is a dot. How do we know how far away it is? It turns out there's a series of things that we use to piggyback. So one way, to, the, the way we know, say, the distances to the nearest stars is what we do is we take into account the fact that the Earth is going around the sun. And so when the Earth is going around the sun, if I'm pointing at something that's far away and I'm moving, I have to move my finger to track where it is. So you basically look where a star is on the sky when the Earth is at one part of its orbit and you wait six months and you see how much it's shifted. And that effect is called parallax. And by how much that angular shift is relative to things that are like effectively infinitely far away, you can triangulate the distance to that thing. And so with very, very high precision of angular resolution on the sky, it turns out you can even measure things that are hundreds of light years away just based on that sort of simple triangulation. Um, there are then steps that we, there are certain stars that are turns out that are sort of characteristic brightnesses like light bulbs that we can use just by measuring their apparent distance and backtrack how far away they are using these sort of light bulbs or what are called standard candles. And there's various standard candles we use for distances and some of the most distant objects we use for standard candles, it turns out, are called supernova, like exploding stars. There's a certain class of supernova that are also kind of standard candles um, that are used for distances. But then when things are far enough away and we can just measure the redshift of the galaxy and we measure a redshift of one, we then use basically the expansion of the universe and general relativity to back out the distances. So there's lots of different techniques that we use to measure distances and um, there's different astronomers that specialize with different techniques. Uh, We'll go walkie, and then we'll go up, and then we'll go here. Okay, we'll go walkie here, and then here, and then there. Okay. okay so, can you give us what, what? What are you? What do you do? What? Are, what? What? <laughs> what do I do? Uh, what? Do you have, you have postdocs that are yeah. working on some hypothesis. Yeah. What, what are the hypotheses that are? Uh, ah. Okay. What, what's an example of some of the stuff that my lab is doing? Yes. Um, well, I'll, I'll, t I'll show you something real fast. Uh, just so happens I have something. Um, so this is, a, this is a work that's actually being led up by a former postdoc of mine who's now a faculty at UC Merced, but I'm doing this in collaboration with her and, and folks there and my students. One of the things we're trying to figure out is whether or not what, what the nature of dark matter is around galaxies. So remember, I said something about how we think that these galaxies are surrounded by all this extra mass that we call dark matter. It turns out that in the standard theories of dark matter, we predict it to be actually not smooth, but very clumpy. And whether or not it's clumpy uh, it gives us a good handle on what the dark matter is. The problem, about, problem with these clumps is they're very small, and dark matter doesn't shine. That's why it's dark. And the only way we can see it is with gravity. And one of the ways we're looking for the evidence of these clumps is with this effect of gravitational lensing that I talked about before. And so we actually have a, we have a project to use the James Webb Space Telescope to look for very, very small distortions in light coming from distant quasars shining through galaxies to look for evidence of this, these clumps and bumps in the dark matter distribution. And my team is working on the very kind of core predictions using detailed simulations of exactly what those clumps should look like and then Anna is an observer, and so she actually knows how to like take the data and make it, you know, you don't want to let me use that telescope. You should really let a, a real observer use it. Um, so, you know, she's very, very good at sort of analyzing the data and, and not messing that part up. And we're working together to try to see whether or not we can see evidence of these very small clumps of dark matter. And if so, we'll be very happy. And if not, we'll also be happy because then we will have killed that theory and we can move on. So, yeah. So that's one, that's one example. Okay. I enjoyed your description of uh, the Andromeda Galaxy being our sister uh, galaxy uh, to the uh, uh, to the, uh, our, our own galaxy. Uh, what that, of course, leaves out is the fact that uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is going to crash into uh, the Milky Way galaxy in about five billion years. Uh, so, if you own real estate in Newport Beach, you might want to <laughs> consider that fact. Uh, and I've heard various theories about what will happen from pretty much nothing to, you know, sell your real estate. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about uh, sure. what, what will happen in five billion years yeah. when, when that happens. Yeah, yeah, well put. So yeah, so that the we're we're the one one galaxy that's not moving away from us is Andromeda. It's coming at us, and it's coming right at us, and we think that in about four or five billion years we're going to crash. Um, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, uh, here is remember how I said that uh, 
if the sun were a piece of pollen, the nearest star to the sun would be another piece of pollen a few miles away. It's like that in Andromeda too. So when two galaxies collide, it turns out stars almost never collide. So what will happen is that the broad configuration of stars in the two galaxies will change a lot. And we think it'll probably end up as a big ball of stars. They won't be disks anymore. It'll be a big ball of stars. There might be some triggered new stars might be born rapidly when that merger occurs. And if so, it's possible we'll have supernova go off that could threaten life and do things. But most likely, there's a world in which um, on, say, another planet, I'll, there's a reason why our planet probably is not relevant, but and I'll tell you in a second. But imagine an alien civilization that was surviving five billion years from now. Uh, the main thing that's going to happen to them is their night sky will be different. Uh, you would no longer see a band of stars in the sky like the Milky Way. You would just see, it would just be a mixed up ball. And by the way, it will be harder to figure out our place in the universe in such a galaxy because it will look isotropic. And us figuring, us seeing clearly that we lived in a disk was what allow us to then figure out that this other smudge on the sky that looked like the Andromeda might be another disk and allowed us to kind of put together this idea that there's a universe of galaxies. If we, if we evolved in a galaxy that was more round and uniform, it would have been harder. So let me back up. So I mentioned it might not be relevant for the Earth, and here's why. Um, and I don't want people to get nervous. <laughs> but in about a billion years, the sun's going to get brighter, and the oceans will boil. Um, now, you got a billion years, so, you know, <laughs> use them wisely. Uh, but so no matter what happens in the short term or, or long term, in about a billion years, uh, we probably won't have liquid water on the Earth anymore. And that's before the sun gets big and swallows up the orbit. Uh, that happens a little faster. And uh, so that's kind of the time horizon for life supported by liquid water on the Earth. But, you know, that's plenty of time. We'll go to Mars and far beyond by then, maybe, right? That's a billion years. You mentioned that the universe is expanding yeah. oh, okay. faster than the speed of light. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, not, not all parts of the universe, but the most distant galaxies. So, how do I think about this? Imagine that um, we had a piece of, uh, uh, imagine you were baking a cake. Right, and the cake has little uh, little uh, raisins in it. And the cake, you're baking the cake, and it's expanding. The whole cake's expanding, and the distance between these the two nearest raisins is moving fast apart at one centimeter an hour. But then there's a raisin on the other side of the cake, and it's moving faster. It's actually moving even faster away from that raisin because all the space in between it and this other thing is all expanding at the same rate. So it turns out that in any configuration where something's kind of expanding uniformly in a uniform medium, things that are, that are farther apart will be expanding farther apart just because the stuff in between is pushing out. And that's why, effectively, when things are farther away, they're moving away faster. That's why it's a signature of this kind of global expansion. So that's what's happening. And when I said that these galaxies are moving away from us faster than the speed of light, what that means really is in a given amount of time, that thing is so far away, there's so much space in between us and it, that it's each of the, you know, the little units of space in between don't have to expand that much in a year. But there's so many units of space in between us that the effective growth rate is huge, and it can be basically faster than the speed of light. But, but the thing that I said is it wasn't traveling through space faster than the speed of light. That's how you transmit information. You transmit information by traveling through space and that's when you get weird paradoxes with information and seeing yourself being born. You have to be able to go faster than the speed of light through space. But because space itself is expanding faster than the speed of light, it turns out that doesn't break anything. But hopefully that was kind of helpful. <laughs> okay, we'll go here and then we'll go here. I just have a probably stupid question. But where yeah. does the light come from? Is that from the telescope that's uh -huh. lighting up the dark matter? In this picture here? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the light, um, there's a distant thing called a quasar, like there's a distant bright galaxy, basically, that's called a quasar, like a flashlight. And it's shining light. And that light, and, and there's an intervening galaxy, 
and the light from that flashlight is just shining through the galaxy, basically. And what we're looking at is how much the light from that flashlight is kind of being bent and warped as it passes by that other galaxy. So the telescope is only absorbing, the telescope's like a digital camera, you know, it's just, it's just, a, it's a, it's like, imagine it's like your iPhone taking a picture, but it's a very big iPhone taking a picture, yeah. I think we'll have this next question and then just one more after. Okay. We'll All right. Here. Uh, yeah. Two quickies. Yeah. One, uh, what is the fuel that's in, mm -hmm. in the, uh, that's being used to keep it out there for up, maybe up to 20 years? I, I think you may have stumped me, Gary. Oh, it's okay. I don't remember. Um, well, then I was going to say, why didn't they use a little uh, reactor or general? I mean, it's you know, not a reactor. It's, it's not. a propellant. It's some, okay. It's some high pressure. But I thought that was interesting that it was going to run out of fuel. Yeah. It's you're, you're right. Actually, it's a good point. I'll mention that. More so of a that, limited life than yeah. Hubble. So one know. of the things that's interesting about this is it's a very good point. It's something I wanted to make, I wanted to make before, so thank you for asking. The limiting, you know, as Gary points out, th this thing is at this kind of precarious orbit called L2. And it's not a stable orbit, it turns out. So imagine, it's sort of like parked on the top of a hill. And it's kind of steady, but sometimes you start to roll, and so you have to correct and so there's, there's, there's a propellant on board that kind of keeps it at the top of the hill so it doesn't roll off. It turns out that that launch, um, the, the, the designed uh, mission life was six years, and, um, and the limiting lifetime of the mission is the fuel that keeps it parked at L2. Now, the fuel was used for two things. It keeps it parked there, but it also parked it there. And so it was launched going very fast, and you have to land at the top of the hill perfectly, and then you use a little bit of this fuel to like land basically at the top of the hill. And the launch was so precise. Um, it was like a hole in one in golf basically that not six years, but we think we'll have more than 20 years of fuel left because it was just, it was just perfectly placed on the top of the hill and then we don't have to use it to keep it going. So it's just another, and so we get to use this instrument, you know, four times longer than we thought. Okay. One more quick one. Um, you can answer this later if you want to, but yeah, I know you study dark matter and it's made up of a couple of different things. And if you have time, maybe you can talk about that just a tiny bit. Dark well, matter? I'll, I'll give this it. to somebody else. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll do real quick on dark matter. Like maybe we've got one more here. Um, look, we don't know what, so okay. So we, we um, there's a kind of a crazy thing about this universe of ours that I've told you all this stuff we understand, but there's a bunch of stuff we don't understand. And it turns out that um, the universe, only about one-sixth of the mass energy density of the universe is in anything that's in the periodic table, any kind of atom, anything we know, anything we understand. And the rest of it is made up of stuff called dark matter and dark energy. The dark energy, it turns out, is sort of like a, a vacuum energy of empty space that's actually driving the universe to accelerate in its expansion. That's, next, that's the next talk. Um, and the dark matter is, uh, has mass, gravitates, causes light to bend and gravity and makes galaxies spin fast and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we don't know what it is because it's not made of normal atoms. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't interact strongly with normal matter. And, and it's, we think it's made up of particles that are sort of beyond the standard model of particle physics. And, it's one of the, and there's ideas about what this dark matter is. We think it's a subatomic particle. There's lots of efforts to detect it directly. Um, and then we're trying to do things like this experiment to sort of figure out maybe what the particle nature of the dark matter is. Okay, that was a very quick dark matter, okay. My question is almost a follow on to that, but a few years back I became aware that there are scientists that study the philosophy of physics and astronomy and cosmology. Mm -hmm. Even at UC Irvine, there's a small Some great group great ones at UC Irvine, yeah. Yeah, so I was just wondering, do you, um, collaborate with some of these people uh, from time to time and yeah. just maybe give us an example. I do actually. Um, there's a couple of great philosophers of science at UCI. Actually one of the best in the, some of the best in the world actually. Really, really good. And one of the things interesting about these philosopher of science people, they really understand quantum mechanics. Like they understand quantum mechanics better than a lot of physicists do. Like really, because they think about it a lot. Like we just use it as a tool and they think about what it means. Um, so we're doing a project uh, right now, actually, with a professor named Jim Weatherall, who's fantastic. Um, and he's very interested in how we use simulations to make predictions in science. And um, you know, it's interesting, in the olden days, a theorist would make a prediction on pen and paper, and it would be exact. 
and then you would go out and you would try to observe the phenomena, right? And you would prove, you know, oh, Einstein was right. He predicted this, and therefore general relativity is right. But there's a lot of predictions. Even if you can write down the equation, you can't solve that equation, and you have to use numerical methods to calculate the answers, and which is kind of like what, what we're doing with this dark matter thing. But you, it's very hard, actually, to know whether or not your computer gave you the right answer because the only way to do the calculations on the computer. And so he's very interested in that process in modern science, the role of computation in, uh, in, in testing theories. Um, and it's, it's actually, you know, it's, it's pretty heady stuff. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so we, have a, we actually have a rich collaboration with them. Yeah. Okay, I think we could go on all night. <laughs> I... Thanks, everybody. Um, I don't... I don't know about, it, about you all, but I am left humbled and full of awe and wondering about those teenage galaxies. I really <laughs> like that vision. <laughs> and I'm so appreciative that you were able to explain this in a way that, that people who are not scientists can understand. That's a, that's a rare Thank talent. You. My pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Yeah.